And so we pray that your word would uh, encourage and strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we finished our series, our short series in Acts last week. And next week, as Pete said, we're starting our new series in Judges, which I'm really excited about. Uh, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible, Judges. There's a lot of drama, a lot going on. In fact, I had a, a seminary professor, uh, Sinclair Ferguson, and if you know him, only he could say this. He said that when he was young, he used to sneak out of his room at night to go read this big Bible on their coffee table uh, and read Judges because it's this dramatic book. And he loved it. And so uh, him telling me that has helped me to read it in a whole different light. So I'm excited about our new series in Judges that will start next week. But I was thinking, what sermon, what text should I preach as this kind of gap, this filler, this connector for our series in Acts that we just finished and our series that we're about to start? And for some reason, Ezekiel 37 came to mind, the Valley of Dry Bones. You see, in Acts, we saw that the power of God was displayed and given through the Spirit of God being given to the people. So we saw the Spirit of God working in His church and in His people powerfully in the book of Acts. And in Judges, what we're going to see is that the people of God continually do what's right in their own eyes. Continually do what's right according to what they see as opposed to what God has said. And so those are the two kind of series that we're uh, trying to bridge together. But our, and so our passage this morning is going to serve as a bridge. It's going to serve as a bridge for Acts because the, spirit, the power of the Spirit of God is going to be on full display. It will be undeniable to see the power of what the Spirit of God does in our text. The, word, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. But it gets translated in three ways. It gets translated with spirit, obviously, but it gets translated as wind or breath. And so whenever you see those three words in our text, it's the same word, all pointing to the spirit of God. And in our short 14-verse passage, that word shows up ten times. And so the spirit of God is a focus, but we're going to see the power connecting us to what we saw and heard about in Acts. And our passage is meant to serve as a bridge to judges, because in our text, the people uh, of God are in exile. They're in exile, so what they are experiencing, what they can see all around them is devastation and destruction and hopelessness. And they are convinced because of what they see that God has abandoned them, that God has left them, that the promises of God, the word of God is no longer true for them. And so it's going to serve as this bridge because we see that the struggle to believe the word of God in the midst of what we see, but we're going to see the spirit of God at work, right? And so Ezekiel 37 is meant to serve as that bridge between these two uh, kind of series and texts. But the way that we're going to see and approach the text this morning, the question it's begging us to ask is this main one big question. This is the question that the entire text hinges on. This is the question that we have to ask over and over and, and seek the answer in our text. In fact, it's, I would argue it's the ultimate question of the entire Bible. It's the question on which I think Christianity either rises or falls on. And here's the question. Can life come out of death? Can life come from death? See, the Bible and our faith boils down to that one question. And however we answer that is either get reason for hope or reason for hopelessness. And so we're going to see what the answer to that question is this morning. So if you can and are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many of, on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. 
Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. And flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land, then you shall know, know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. The Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, you can be seated. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would do the very thing that we are just read, that you would renew us, renew our hope, and make us alive, that you would, your spirit would work in a mighty way through your preached word this morning. And we ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so from the very beginning all the way to the end of our passage, it is unbelievably clear who the main actor is. That God is the one who's acting. God is the one who's at work from the beginning to the end of our passage. He uses and includes the prophet Ezekiel, but God's the one directing the entire scene, the entire vision. And it's interesting that God's so active in this passage because the context of our passage is about the people of God who have lost all hope that God will act and work on their behalf. So God is the one who's the main actor in the context of a people of God who have lost their hope that God would act on their behalf. It's not some general sense of hope that they've lost. It's a specific hopelessness, a hopelessness that comes with being in exile. That they lost hope that God is for him. That God's, uh, they've lost hope that God's blessing and his promises are still true for them. They've lost hope that God will act for them on their behalf and for their good. They believe that they have been cut off. That God, in a sense, has left them out to die. And they're as good as dead already, even though they're not dead yet. And so right at the outset, we have to ask ourselves the question, when do we lose hope? What things in our life have caused us to lose hope or for our hope to fade, to doubt God's goodness towards and for us? When have you doubted his favor? When have you doubted his presence and nearness in your life? I think throughout the Bible and throughout my own life, you can see it in two big categories. One category is, is when we experience suffering. When suffering comes into our life, when life actually gets hard, we start to doubt God's goodness for us. When things don't turn out as we have planned with our best of intentions, we're not asking for everything. We're asking for good things, reasonable things. But when those things don't work out the way that we work for, the way that we dreamed about, the way that we planned, we start to doubt his goodness. We doubt it when our, the relationships that we have become broken, crumbled, and complicated. The people that were once near and dear to us are now far and distant, whether proximity or through uh, just our relationship with them. We can doubt his goodness for us and lose hope when our finances are in a struggle and a bind, and no matter how frugal you try to get, how why as you try to be with your money, it always seems 
like it's stress and you don't know if, if it's going to be enough. You can lose hope for God when you're in a career that you've given your life to, that you've invested in, that you've worked hard for, and it feels like a dead end. It feels like the hope is being sucked out of you each and every day you go to work. You can lose hope when you get sick and a diagnosis that threatens your life, that comes in as an invasion. You lose hope when the people that you do love, that you are close to, they, they die. You lose hope that God is for you. We lose hope because we look at our circumstances, we look at our situation, and we conclude that God's not for me. We determine that God's not for me because if he was, he would not have allowed this to happen. If God was for me, he would have answered my prayer. So one big category where threatened, our hope is threatened and we lose hope is through suffering. But the other one doesn't actually have to do when something happens to us, but has to do with what we do or what we fail to do. In other words, we struggle to believe God's favor, presence, and love for us when we sin. When we struggle with sin, when it's a habitual sin, one that only we know about, but we can't seem to break. Or a big sin that we never thought we'd ever do. Or this is that gnawing sin that over and over wreaks havoc on your life, and nobody knows how much you think about it. Nobody knows how hard it is, how much time it takes in your mind and in your energy. Right? You can play the game and you can smile, but we lose hope when sin seems to have won and conquered. We lose hope that God is not, is, uh, that he's not with us, he's not for us, because we know that we have and we continue to do things that should cause him to be against us. A sin that we actually enjoy, that we go towards. See, sin and suffering is what life is like in exile. When you are in exile, sin and suffering is what life is like. And the truth is, like Israel in our passage, we are actually in exile. Ever since Genesis 3, we have been exiled from the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. So we live in a world of exile. And because of that, the world and our lives don't work as they're meant to. The world and our lives don't work as they're meant to. Death is the ultimate reminder of that. So no matter how much hope you have, death always comes in to remind us things aren't the way they should be. That there's an end to the goodness. Things aren't the way they should be. You see, death is, death is not natural. Death is not natural. No matter how much you try to tell yourself that, death is not the way that things are meant to be. We tell ourselves that death is natural because it's inevitable. But that's not the same thing. Because it's inevitable doesn't mean it's natural. But deep down, you and I know it's not natural, right? Deep down, you and I, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, you know death is an intruder. We have... Uh, we have a lot, there are a lot of wealthy, powerful people who, have spent, who are spending tons of time and money trying to extend life and avoid death because they know death is not natural. Because there's this longing to continue on and all power to them. I'm for them extending life. But the reason why they're doing that, not because death is natural, because they know intuitively deep down that it's an intruder. That no matter how old someone is or how young they are when they die, it is an unwelcome enemy. But life in exile is full of death. Life in exile is full of all kinds of death. And so when you live in exile, the temptation, as we've talked about, is to put our hope in things that are good, that are meant to be enjoyed, but they can't take the weight of our hope. Because they don't last. Because life in exile is full of death. And so when you put your hope in something that can't take the weight of hope, 
sin and suffering comes in and threatens those things and our hope falters and our hope fades and it goes up and down according to our circumstances or according to our success of how we're doing in the Christian life or against sin. But God gives us Ezekiel 37. God gives Israel this vision in the midst of exile. This vision of the valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel, he comes to Ezekiel and he gives Ezekiel this VIP tour of this valley. This valley of bones. And Ezekiel sees that it's full of bones, he tells us. But not just any bones. These bones are very dry. These are dry bones. See, God could have just shown Ezekiel a corpse or two. And maybe gotten the point across and said similar things. But he doesn't. He takes him to this valley that's full of one thing. That's unqu unquestionably, undeniably full of death. The picture is one of death in all its finality, in all its intensity. There is no life around. No life remains at all. And then in verse 3, God asks Ezekiel this strange question. After giving him the tour of the valley of very dry bones, he asks, can these bones live? Well, the obvious answer is no, right? Bones, bones are the opposite. Bones don't live. Bones reveal death. They scream death. But I, the question that God is asking Ezekiel is actually a little bit more complicated or has more to it than we first, uh, first meets the eye. Because it's not first and foremost a question in general, do bones live? Can bones in general live? But can these specific bones, these bones in the valley of exile, can these bones live is the question. And the answer that we get to that question will lead us to be able to answer the question that the entire Bible hinges on. Can life come from death? But in order to get there, we have to ask the question and answer the question of this vision. In the valley of the dry bones and the context it's in, that we learn in verse 9, that these bones were people who were slain, meaning they lost a battle. They lost their life in a battle. And so if you're a prophet at this time, the interpretation is, They've lost battle because it's a judgment of God. Because the conclusion is if God was with them, if God was for them, they would have won. And so most prophets would conclude that. But more than that, these bones are all on the surface of the valley. They're all visible on the top of the ground, on the surface of the valley. They're not buried. They were left out in the open to be devoured by animals and by birds. And so a prophet like Ezekiel would know his Bible. He would know Deuteronomy 28, that that's actually a specific covenant curse for people who break covenant with God, who break relationship with God, who sin against God, that their bodies aren't to be buried, but to be left out in the open, to be devoured by animals. And so this question has a lot more baggage than it first appears. This question, can these bones live? These bones are full of people who actually earn and deserve the death that they got. These bones are full of people who broke covenant with God, who turned away from him and have lost their life. So the question is, can these bones live? And you're like, I'm not sure I need all the information. I know bones don't live. But the point is that the question has more baggage, is more complicated than what at first we see. Ah, because these people deserve death. They deserve what they got. And so God's asking Ezekiel a theological question. Can these bones live? And now the answer is still the same, but it's more clear why. The answer is no. To us, no. But Ezekiel's a good prophet. He can't deny what he sees right in front of his face. He can't deny that they deserve death. But he also knows that all things are possible with God who created all things. And so he says, uh, what do you think, God? <laughs> uh, now he gives a more uh, spiritual, better answer than that. He, he actually says, oh, Lord God, you know, which is the right answer. At first, I thought it was a cop-out answer, but it's the right answer. He's putting the ball back in God's court. You know. They shouldn't, but you're God. So, oh, God, you know. And then God, the one who asked the question, actually gives the answer. 
by instructing Ezekiel to preach over these bones. God tells Ezekiel to say to the bones, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And if I'm Ezekiel, I'm saying to myself, you want me to do what? You want me to talk to bones? You want me to preach to bones? God, they don't have ears. They can't hear me. They can't see me. They don't have eyes. They don't have hearts that, need to be, that can be transformed. You want me to do what? But then God continues to and then tells him what to say. God says that he's going to cause breath to enter them and that they, he's going to cause them to live. And then we get the description of what's going to take place in these four discrete stages. That he's going to reconnect the bones with sinews. That he's going to cover the bones with flesh. That he's going to overlay the flesh with skin. And he's going to infuse them with breath. And it's fascinating. It's shocking how God makes this happen. He doesn't say, stand back, Ezekiel. Watch me work and then pull out his Harry Potter wand. That he's going to make them come to life. No, as we said, he says, prophesy, preach the word of the Lord, preach to these bones. And Ezekiel, when he starts to preach to them, we're told everything that God said would happen starts to happen, that there's a rattling. Imagine, you're full, in a valley full of dry bones, you start to preach to them, and they start to move, and you hear, you see them come together, and you hear the bones clinking and rattling together. Imagine the feeling that would happen in each stage that you're preaching to them. But then at the end of verse 8, there seems to be a problem or a hiccup in this plan. Because the bodies have been put back together, they've been recreated through the preached word, but there's no breath in them. Almost as if causing us to question, that was a pretty cool trick, God, but these bones, they were too dead. These people did Broke the covenant one too many times, right? Maybe th what you did was amazing, but it, they were too far gone to actually get the breath of life from you. But this is not a hiccup. And just as soon as you can start to formulate a question in your mind of if God's going to do it, uh, it's, he breathes life into them. It's purposeful that we're told at verse 8 that they're together with no breath. It's purposeful that this happens in two phases. Because what this is showing us is what's needed. That what's needed is not some, simply some biological, chemical remaking of the body. There's also a need to be spiritually reconnect, recreated. There's a need to be, have a spiritual rebirth, not just a physical one. Because as the end of verse 6 tells us, in order to live, we have to be recreated, and to live is to know the Lord. Not know about him, but know him relationally, know him personally, know who he is and what he's all about. See, the way that this recreation happens, the fact that it has these four distinct stages, is actually an undoing of how a body decomposes. It's a complete undoing of how a body that's dead starts to decompose. And what that's showing us is that every part of death that these bodies went through is being undone. Every part of death is being undone. And this wasn't done by some second rate, this wasn't a second rate stitch job from some dropout medical student. This was done by the Spirit of God, the capital S Surgeon. And this process that is given and that's shown to us should make us think of Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, when God forms Adam, he, it's this two-phase creation process. He forms Adam with his hands, and then he breathes life into him, breathes life into his nostrils. So what is this saying in this two-phase process? It's saying that he's not just promising to make us alive again, to make us live again, but to recreate us as we were meant to be. To recreate us as if there was no sin in us or in the world. The picture is not a restoration of what you were before, but it's so much more than that. It's what you were always meant to be. 
And this passage could not be more clear or clear on how that takes place. Remember the Spirit of God ten times. But there's a pattern. Word, Spirit, Word, Spirit, Word, Spirit is constantly in this text. Prophesy, preach the Word of God and the Spirit works. Prophesy, preach the Word of God and the Spirit works. That's the pattern we have here. See, the Spirit of God works and moves. He brings life from death through the preached Word of God. So this is revealing to us and telling us what you and I need. What we need this morning. We need to have the Word of God preached to us. And it's through that preached Word that the Spirit of God works life in us. One commentator writes, this passage should be encouraging to Christians who may have given up hope that God can bring restoration and renewal to certain areas of their life. Whether a long struggle with sin or broken relationships or even hard affliction, my circumstances can often blind us to God's life-giving power. The vision of dry bones should remind us that our God truly is in the business of giving life where everything seems hopelessly dead. And I'll add, especially life in exile, when everything around us seems hopelessly dead. And this passage ends with God's promise, a word from God. And he says, I have spoken, I will do it. It's not dependent on you. I have spoken, I will do it. Notice what he doesn't ask. He doesn't ask, can these bones make themselves live? No, he asks, can these bones live? And then God says, I will do it. I have declared it. Can life come from death? The answer from our past is the answer from God is a resounding yes. I'm tempted to cuss here because the thrust of it is so clear. The answer is, if it wasn't recorded, I would cuss. But the answer is so clear. It is a resounding, can life come from death? Yes! Yes, it can. So what we need this morning, what we will need next week, what we will need next year is for the Spirit of God to renew us through the preaching of the Word of God. But listen to me, this doesn't magically happen by any Word of God being preached, just any random Word of God being preached. Remember John in his Gospel points us to the, who the Word is. The Word of God is Jesus. Life happens, the Spirit of God creates and renews life when Jesus, as the Word of God, is preached. So that's who we need. That's the one that brings life to us. We need the Word who was with God but willingly entered into exile by leaving his home in heaven and took on flesh. We need the one who didn't just think that he was cut off in exile like Israel does, like we go through. We need the one who actually was truly cut off from God on the cross. We need the one who is the creator and giver of life, but willingly entered death on our behalf. How do we know? <clears throat> How do we know that life comes from death? Because Jesus' tomb is not full of his bones, it's empty. How do we know? Because his tomb is empty. Death is defeated by the giver of life. I think I'm tired. <laughs> um, how do we know that life can come from death? Because the supreme word of God, the gospel message itself, tells us not what we must do to earn life, but what God has done in Christ to give life. So when you struggle with sin, 
when you go through suffering in life, when your hope fades, when life in exile makes you question God's presence, power, and love for you, what do you need? When you question, can life come from death, what do you need? You need the word of God preached to you. You need Jesus, the one who entered into exile on your behalf and conquered death. The word himself is what you need. So preach this word to, your, to yourself. Come to church to hear the word preached to you. You cannot make yourself live, but he will. He promised and he declares it so. Amen.